All right, good afternoon. It is 301, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Wichita Area Metropolitan Planning Organization Transportation Policy Policy Body Meeting for Tuesday, September 10th, 2024. Glad everyone could join us today. We have quorum between here and online, so great to see you all, especially if you're here joining us in person. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with the regular business. First is to approve the agenda for September 10th, 2024. I would entertain a motion to approve today's agenda. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? All those in favor, say aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next is approval of TPV minutes for August 13th, 2024. Um, I know that that was a very long city of Wichita Council meeting, so several of us weren't here. Um, but um, hopefully you've all had a chance to review the minutes. And if so, if there's no changes, I'd entertain a motion to approve. So Thank you. Is there a second? second? All those in favor, say aye. Anyone opposed? All that need to abstain? I know all of City of Wichita will need to abstain. Anyone else who couldn't be with us? Andover? Abstain. Okay, thank you very much. Next, Chad, Director's Report. Let's do it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members of the Transportation Policy Body. Uh, we have a few items to report. Uh, at your, uh, you know, there is a flyer on Key 15 Corridor Study. Mm -hmm. Uh, J.B. Wilson is here today. Uh, he might as well chime in at the end in the reports. There's an open house on September 18th. Uh, it's uh, 4 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday next week. So it's uh, uh, it looks like this, and it's in your area. Every table, there's one page at every place, location. Um, we have, you know, county and city of Wichita, city of Derby, Vampo staff, as well as KDOT, it's a good collaboration, collaborative effort on this study. We just started, this is our first public meeting. Uh, just want to uh, let you know, and JB might add at, at some point later today as well. And then we have a couple more items uh, from staff as well. Uh, I think Nick has tip updates, some um, metropolitan transportation plan um, uh, updates as well. So let me request Nick to briefly uh, report to you. Thank you, Chad. I'm now going to give the bi-monthly TIP project statuses update. According to the WAMPO Transportation Improvement Program policy, i.e. Appendix I of the current TIP, there is a reasonable progress policy under which we are required to report to the TAC and the TPB at least once every two months on the statuses of projects that are programmed to receive WAMPO sub-allocated funding in the current federal fiscal year or that were programmed to receive it in a past federal fiscal year but have not yet finished the project. You should find this table detailing that in the packets in front of you. You may find that there is a slight difference in it from when it went up online last week. That is because we made some updates to it based off of information received from KDOT since then on projects that have had obligation activity uh, since uh, the information was originally compiled for the TAC last month. And this is the last one of uh, the 2024 federal fiscal year, meaning the next one in two months will include 2025 projects, which after this meeting, we will solicit information on from project sponsors to get information on the 2025 projects, most especially when during 2025 they expect funds to obligate because that will let us know what dates to work towards and when we will be able to make changes or not since there are certain things that cannot be done after a project has been obligated and it'll give us an idea of what we can work with in the event of projects 
or uh, having de-obligations from past years or there being some other change in available funds, uh, either in the positive or negative direction, and to let us know what we have to work with to deal with those situations going forward. And that's why we do these bi-monthly updates to make sure everything is on track and gets in in the year it is supposed to and let us know uh, what is uh, open for wiggle room during the year. And here is a map of, of all the projects that are in there, the 2024 ones and the past year projects that is also in your packet. And finally, just a table of 2024 non-sub allocated projects with federal funding, just to put as to provide that information as well here. So any questions on the bi-monthly update before I continue? No. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Next. Yep. Next item is just a very quick uh, update to let you know that we are currently in the public comment period for Amendment 2 to the Federal Fiscal Year 2025 through Federal Fiscal Year 2028 Transportation Improvement Program that is open through the 13th. So you can go on to www.wampo.org slash transportation hyphen improvement hyphen program to find information on that uh, amendment that has been proposed and public comment can be made on that at will through the 13th. And then that uh, will go to the TAC uh, at the September TAC meeting and then back to this body on October 8th for a vote on approval, most likely. And then they would get into the KDOT step in November. Now moving on to, also, I assume that there were no questions on that last item. So moving on to the next item, an update on Metropolitan Transportation Plan 2050, or as we shorthand it around here, MTP 2050. Under federal law, all metropolitan planning organizations are required to have a Metropolitan Transportation Plan going out to a planning horizon that is at least 20 years in the future and it must be updated at least once every five years. The last one for WAMPO was adopted in June of 2025. That was called Reimagined Move 2040. And now we are developing the new one going out to, to 2050. With, it is led by WAMPO staff with support from consultants and a plan advisory committee. We have had three rounds of public engagement so far in support of this, which has included stakeholder listening sessions, presentations at community meetings, pop-up events, social media posts, print articles, TV and radio interviews, and surveys distributed in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese available both online and on paper forms distributed at meetings and pop-up events. The first round was May 13th through July 31st, 2023. It involved 11 listening sessions and resulted in the receipt of 832 survey responses. The second round was December 1st, 2023 through February 29th, 2024 and produced 221 survey responses. And the most recent round was May 20th through June 30th, 2024, and resulted in 474 survey responses. Now again, these survey responses are not meant to provide a statistically uh, scientific representation of the region, but we are trying to get as much input as possible. So that we, it is good that we got this many. 
Meanwhile, we have been developing a project list. The first step was a call for projects from September 15th, 2023 through February 2nd, 2024. It was a combined call for projects, both for MTP 2050 and the 2025 to 2028 tip. The submitted projects were scored and ranked by WAMPO staff and consultants and reflected in the travel demand model. Starting on October 3rd, the project selection committee, which already decided which projects would be selected for the tip that this body approved last month, which projects should get into the fiscally constrained list of the MTP. But projects that were submitted but are not selected for the fiscally constrained list will get onto an illustrative list, meaning that if available funds turn out to be more than what are currently projected, then illustrative list projects may get funding in addition to the fiscally constrained projects getting funding. And those fiscally constrained projects will be recommended for one of two time bands of 2029 through uh, 2038 and 2039 through 2050. This is in addition to the TIP projects for 2025 to 2028 also being reflected in the MTP. Meanwhile, we are also developing the various written sections of the MTP. And, we, and as we are completing them, we are putting the draft sections online at www.wampo.org slash MTP 2050, including the main document chapters of plan purpose and development, regional trends, existing conditions, system management, system performance report, financial plan and project selection and list plus the various appendices you see listed on the right. And our next steps, we will continue to make uploads to the website of draft sections this month and next month. On September 23rd, the TAC will make recommendations regarding WAMPO supporting the Kansas performance measures that, that are used by KDOT, which will be reflected in the MTP. And then a TPB vote the following month will take place on supporting those performance measure targets. And then in October, we'll have at least one PSC meeting, possibly more, but if we, but it could just be one if they decide everything at the first meeting, but just in case we have another date scheduled. And then tentatively in October, 2024, we may, we will have a PAC meeting, PAC meeting number six, which will look at the PS, hopefully the PSC's the recommendations and the draft MTP. And once the and once we have the full draft MTP, it will be reviewed by the PAC and state and federal staff. And WAMPO staff will address any comments that are made. And then in early 2025, we will have a 30-day official public comment period for MTP 2050, which we will regard as public engagement round four. And, and then finally in April of 2025, there will be a TAC recommendation on MTP 2050 and in May 2025, a TPB vote on approval in order to get in the month prior to the five year anniversary of the last MTP being adopted. And then once all the hard stuff is done, we will have one last round of public engagement, round five, to introduce the public to the 
approved plan so that more people will know that it is out there. And that concludes that update. Are there any questions? Thanks, Nick. Um, I think for the benefit of our members, PSC stands for Project Selection right. Committee and PSC stands for Plan Advisory Committee. Yes. Um, as Nick mentioned, this MTP long range transmission plan is updated every five years. The last one was updated and adopted in June 2020. Now it's five years, so therefore May 2025. Um, this is an update. There's a lot of documents and preparations. Not only Nick, all the staff at Vampo is working on uh, completing these reports and updating on the website. And Dora especially is working on designing those in InDesign and various other staff are also working on these reports uh, while Peter is helping with data and performance measures as well. So just want to give you uh, a status on long range transmission plan development and the milestones for you. And then of course you hear lost short range transmission plan tip uh, many times. So let me, uh, if there are any uh, questions so we can elaborate, otherwise we'll go to next item. And don't forget on page 36 is my favorite WIMPO document, the acronym dictionary, so. Thanks, Vicky. Um, and, and then the next item we have is uh, uh, intelligent transportation system uh, that you approved. Um, the RFP and the consulting selection process occurred. And let me request Peter to uh, give a status on the upcoming steps on that. Good afternoon, TPB members. This item's real short and sweet. Um, after we approved the, or after the contract was approved at our last TPB meeting, we have coordinated with our consultant, JEO, and have gotten our first ITS architecture kickoff meeting uh, planned for September 23rd, and 1.30. Um, beyond that, not too much to report. Hopefully we'll have more as we get these steering committees going on kind of a regular schedule and get you guys regular updates. Any questions for me? Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Peter. Uh, last item is uh, annual bicycle and pedestrian count. As you all know, uh, tomorrow and day after, and then Saturday, there's count that's happening and many have volunteered and many of you have helped also. And Kim and Dora are excited about this event and both Kim and Dora predicts nice weather for this. Uh, and also uh, we all wanna thank you and appreciate your support in this uh, effort of uh, counting pedestrians and bicyclists. We usually count all modes of transport like as much as possible. Vehicles we always count and ridership we have data it's the bike pit that usually we do not have a periodic, and this will help monitor the trends. Um, so that's all on that. Anything else, Kim? Okay. So with that, uh, and our, uh, and thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, Chad, keep on going. Consent agenda item D. So, Marky. Hi, Marky Jonas, Administrative and Public Outreach Coordinator. We have a few items on the consent agenda today, um, including a revision to the TBB bylaws, um, an update to the Technical Advisory Committee roster, and then a contract for copier and printer services. Um, so I'll just give a very quick explanation of each of those. Please stop me if I get ahead of myself. Okay, so for the TBB bylaws at the most recent executive committee meeting, we reviewed them and we noticed that there is essentially a typo. Um, and so this is a proposed revision to correct language in article eight committees, section 8.1 technical advisory committee to match a revision approved in February, stating that the vice chair of the TBB may, but is not required to, serve as the chair of the TAC. And that should be page 23 in your packet where that 
edit is shown. And, and Mark, yeah, I might just jump in and Russ or anybody else from the executive committee, but we've gone back and forth on this issue. We think we're at the right place where for a while you had to be the TAC chair to be the vice chair. And then we had where you couldn't be the TAC chair if you were the vice chair. And we want it to be more of a May situation because someone like Russ, who's doing a fantastic job as TAC chair and vice chair, and thank you for your service. But other folks have said, I can only really handle one or the other, or I'd really like to be vice chair, but I don't want to be TAC chair, whatever. So we just feel that this gives us the most flexibility within the TPB um, to be able to encourage people to serve in leadership roles. Russ, is there anything you want to add? No, that's uh, exactly right. Okay. So. Yeah, exactly right. No one ever says that. Thank you. Exactly right. <laughs> You're my favorite human today. All right, Marky, keep going. Thank you. Great. Yes. Thank you for filling that in too. Um, okay. And then the next item is just an update to the technical advisory committee. Um, within the bylaws for TAC, it states that the transportation policy body is the authorizing body um, and outlines how members are supposed to be appointed to the TAC, um, explaining that the TBB is supposed to um, approve the recommendations and membership. So as WAMPO staff, we have received notice from Wichita Transit requesting a change in representation on the TAC. Um, so this item is just for the TVB to approve that change. Okay, and then the last item is an updated contract for copier and printer services. So um, through our purchasing policy, it requires that our computer and other IT related hardware um, is acquired through Sedgwick County's procured vendors. Since we are hosted in the county building, um, it has to make sure that it will work on the existing network. Um, and so this contract is with Conica Minolta Business Solutions, um, who also provides the county with multifunctional printer services. Um, and within this contract, it includes the printer, toner, connection, support, and then any labor or maintenance parts. Um, and it is a term for 60 months at a fixed amount of $469.42 per month. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. With that, your action options are to approve the consent agenda as presented, not approve the consent agenda, or approve the consent agenda with specific changes. The staff recommendation is to approve as presented. Thank you, Marky, and thank you for getting us through some of those items that are really important, right, and we need to address not always the most glamorous, but still the functionality of the organization. Um, based on your presentation, I would approve uh, that we, uh, I would um, ask that we approve the consent agenda as, a, as presented. I'll start. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Anyone aye. opposed? Anyone opposed? Awesome. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Public comments. Alan's not here today, right? I knew something was off, but does anyone else? I can't see over in the corners. Anyone here from the public who would like to have three minutes to let us know what you think? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. We don't have any action items today, so we'll go right into discussion and updates. So the first item A, KDOT safety presentation with Vanessa. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome, Vanessa. Hi, I am going to try and, are you showing the slides there at, um, on your guys' screen? Just want to confirm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so my name's Vanessa Spartan. I've been um, in front of you all before to present on the Drive to Zero. I'm here today to present an overview of where we are today on a update of our statewide uh, strategic highway safety plan. Um, this is a plan that's required um, by Federal Highway Administration, and we update it every five years. Um, but it is uh, much more than that. 
um, if you go to the next slide, I'll kind of just start going through things. So I always like to start with um, kind of a why or behind the numbers to remind us all of why we do this important work. Then I'll give you an update of um, where we are with the plan update and its uh, core features and goals, what stakeholder engagement looks like, um, where you all can um, either get involved in that process or even helping us with localizing the drive to zero uh, once the plan is complete. We'll talk about the schedule and then um, other ways to get involved. So if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so in Kansas, over the last five years, we've lost 2,500, or sorry, 2,057 people in crashes on public roads. And in addition, um, more than 8,300 people have been seriously injured. These two categories are the ones that we monitor from a federal performance measure standpoint. Um, while we do look at all crashes, these two are the ones that have um, lifelong impacts, right? These are life altering crashes um, that have societal impact as well. If you go to the next slide, um, the, the positive thing to hear is that we're actually trending really well as a state. Beginning in 2020 and since then, for the last three and a half years, we have been trending downward in fatalities. So we're trending down in the number of lives we've lost to crashes on public roads. Uh, what's more, um, we are currently standing 12% below the same week last year. So we're looking like in 2024, we will have uh, another year of uh, fatal reductions if we can hold to where we're trending right now. Um, and, and then I want to add one more thing, which is that actually we looked uh, at the last five years of data across all severity types of crashes, and we're actually down 8% as a whole for the state. That said, in that serious injury category, that, that second category of severity, um, we are trending upward. So, um, and it's a pretty sizable trend upward that we're seeing as a state. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we'll drive straight into the Drive to Zero plan. So we currently are working under our current plan, which ends in 2024, and we are under the process of updating our next plan, which will have a planning horizon of 2025 to 2029. So um, a strategic highway safety plan or what we call our drive to zero plan, it is meant to, to drive our strategic investments and to focus on those serious injury and fatal crashes. And one of the things that we're pivoting to in this plan update is the safe system approach. So um, you'll hear me talk about that here in a little bit, but the idea is that um, we will, we will still go out and address crash hotspot locations, but really what we are looking at and trying to focus on is how do we reinforce the layers of a safe system in Kansas? And that can easily go beyond what we can do at the DOT with the programs we have. That's where getting local agency, agencies involved, getting um, health organizations involved, other areas is, is really critically important. Um, if you go to the next slide. So some core features of, a, of the Drive to Zero plan is that it's data driven, um, but it does require a lot of communications and collaborations because as we know, uh, data doesn't make decisions. It actually is the values that we hold that make those decisions. Uh, it is a living document with strategic actions. It influences our investment areas um, and it's developed and implemented across three different types of stakeholder groups. I'm going to go over each of those here in a little bit. So we have our Drive to Zero Coalition or DTZ Coalition. That's our executive body. And then we have two support bodies below a strategy, a series of strategy teams and a series of support teams. Um, if you go to the next slide. So with our five-year update, we have... Um, some things that we are going to focus on. Um, so I mentioned the safe system approach, and I think I lost the, the animation and the version that you guys have uh, in front of you, but um, the safe system approach has five key objective areas, right? So how do we make road users safer? How do we advance vehicles with advanced safety features, right? How do we continue to implement those in the state? What can we do from a standpoint of speed management? Um, how can we make roads safer? And then the last reinforcing layer is post-crash care. So in the event of a crash, how do we save lives? Um, so that Swiss cheese model that you're seeing there is the idea is that you have to actually pass through each layer of, of the safe system to actually get a fatal crash. So that's where we'll be looking at, you know, anytime that, that we have a fatality occur, then it means that we didn't pass all of the layers of, of the Swiss cheese. Um, 
So that's really the focus of this new plan. Um, we will also be incorporating findings and strategies that come from various secondary assessments that we've completed over the last couple of years. Um, we are going to be focusing on increasing awareness and a sense of shared ownership in both the plan as well as its outcomes and outputs, and then uh, localizing the plan. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. If you go to the next slide. Um, so the executive body, the Drive to Zero Coalition, they champion um, transportation safety in Kansas on all public roads, and they tap skills and resources of many different agencies and organizations to advance that mission. If you go to the next slide, um, that photo shows you less than half of the members of the Drive to Zero. That's who was at our Drive to Zero day last year. Um, we we currently have 30 members that are just shy of 30 members sitting on our Drive to Zero coalition. And these are executives that represent federal and state entities, nonprofit and advocacy groups, um, as well as local governments in different forms, right? So from anything from League of Kansas Municipalities and Kansas Association association of counties to groups that represent law enforcement um, and others. What's not here, because they don't really have a, a logo to use, but we have both the um, the chairs of the House and Senate Transportation Committees that also serve on the coalition. You go to the next level, uh, the next slide, sorry. Uh, so supporting the Drive to Zero Coalition are two different sets of teams. So strategy teams follow those safe system objectives. They focus on the most common crash types and patterns that affect you know, fatal and serious injury crashes. And so the teams are organized under those objectives of safer people, safer roads, safer vehicles, safer speeds, and post-crash care. And then there's three um, support teams that have a lot of resources and skills that can help us in the spaces of data, policy, and communication. So they really help to advance initiatives of the Drive to Zero. Um, if you go to the next slide. So localizing the plan is something that I think you all will be um, acutely interested in. Um, we have here that metropolitan planning organizations and regional planning commissions are, are kind of targets for us to do some additional engagement with. Um, also, there's a lot of different agencies across the state that have safety plans. Um, there are, I think, a total of 103 counties that either have a safety plan or are underway with it. And then there's also, um, we have 45 recipients of the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant in the state. So those are some good targets for us. We also want to specifically reach out to some um, cities and counties that are overrepresented in the data that may not already be doing um, safety planning activities. So what will this look like? So we'll do some targeted outreach to those specific groups. And um, as of right now, what we're planning to do is a little bit of a uh, road tour, if that makes sense, hitting up probably at least a meeting in each of the KDOT districts and inviting those various local agencies to participate. Um, and then in addition, we're going to utilize networks of government related organizations and planning organizations. So those government related organizations are ones that I've mentioned before, like the League of Kansas Municipalities, Kansas Association of Counties, Kansas Public Health Association, Kansas Emergency Med Medical Services Association, uh, groups that represent law enforcement. And then the planning organizations are a little bit different. So these are organizations like American Public Works Association, American Planning Association, and the Association of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna blank on it, uh, consultant engineer companies. I, I think I did that incorrectly. But these are the types of organizations that represent planning and engineering firms that are doing safety planning. So they're helping local agencies across the state to identify priorities. Um, so getting to those professionals and having specific conversations with them is also gonna be valuable. Um, in terms of our timeline for that, it's mostly going to be once the plan is actually done. So we'll be able to say, here's what we have from a statewide initiative standpoint, but we also wanna hear what's happening with goals and priorities for you locally, and then trying to match up resources um, that we have available at the state versus, you know, other challenges that might go beyond what resources we have available. Um, if you go to the next slide. 
So in terms of the plan update schedule, we're currently in September. So we are in the process of analyzing our data, working on strategies um, for each of those teams, and then identifying performance measures or performance indicators for each of those initiatives. Um, as we roll into the winter, we will be focusing on writing and refining the plan. We will be seeking plan approval from uh, Federal Highway Administration in June or July. Our, our aim is for end of state fiscal year. And then from 2025 to 2029, we focus on implementation and, like I said, localizing the plan, um, kind of getting it beyond a state agency thing into something that we also have kind of regular interactions with local uh, government. Um, so um, how to get involved, next slide. If you, uh, I like to say you could join us on the drive to zero. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's a couple different things. So identifying ways to localize safety with your stakeholders and in your organization. I wanna just um, say for a moment how critical cities and counties are in traffic safety. And that's because you guys really embrace all of the ease of transportation safety, right? You help to educate the public. You decide how traffic laws are enforced. Um, you decide the types of infrastructure investment to be made. And then many of your organizations also have various forms of post-crash care, whether that is, uh, you know, your first responders are your law enforcement, your EMS, your fire departments, right? So there's a lot of decisions that you have to make on the local scale um, in terms of the investment choices that you make, and then also being um, responsive to your stakeholders in your community. So working on identifying ways that you can help localize safety in your own uh, communities is, is a very good start. Um, we also have, uh, this year will be our second year, we're hosting Drive to Zero Day at the Capitol. I have a slide coming up about that. Um, this year, the Kansas Transportation Safety Conference will be in Wichita. I have another slide about that to give you some details. If you go back before we advance. Um, and then uh, we have a couple different ways to get involved. So we have a Friends of the Drive to Zero Coalition list, which um, that allows you to kind of get the communications about the meetings. Um, and then you can either watch those meetings on Zoom or you can actually come to Topeka and sit in and listen in on those uh, executive meetings. They're held quarterly. And then as I mentioned, those strategy teams earlier, that allows you to kind of uh, collaborate across different disciplines to focus on what we're gonna do with strategic initiatives. Um, in total, that between that friends list and the strategy team list, I think we, we have 260 stakeholders on our list right now. So it really is a, a wide breadth of, of engagement that we have. I have their email address. So if you or, or anybody in your, in your organizations wants to get involved, they can um, email us. If you go to the next slide now. Um, so here's the two big events that I, I mentioned. So on February 12th, we're going to be at the Capitol building in Topeka. So um, it is a media event, an open house, and a networking opportunity. Um, we we decided to focus on doing something at the Capitol to help raise awareness of, of the multi-agency work that's being done, um, but also just, you know, providing a forum for others to, to learn and hear more. And then our 30th annual Transportation Safety Conference will be at the Hyatt in downtown Wichita on March 4th and 5th. Um, we have a specific day for law enforcement only that's on March 3rd. Um, the last bullet just gives you some of the high level numbers from last year. So we had over 400 registrants. We had 19 concurrent sessions. We had three keynote or plenary speakers. Those are um, folks that we bring in from out of state to talk about um, big things that are happening in the industry. And then we also do these regional discussions that really focus on coalition building um, in each kind of corner of the state, if that makes sense. Um, if you go to the next slide now. Um, and then the next Drive to Zero Coalition meeting is coming up on November 13th. Um, our website there has ways for you to register either for watching on Zoom or attending in person. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, these are the dates of our series of strategy team meetings that are coming up. So we just had a, a round of meetings in July. The next round is happening in late October. And again, if anybody's interested in those, they can email us. And then I'm going to end on the last slide, which has all of that information repeated again. So our email address is there and our website. All of those meeting dates and times and opportunities are on the website as well. So if you didn't scribble it down in your notes, um, you can also find it online. 
Um, so that's all I have for today. Open up to any questions or comments. Any questions for Vanessa or comments? Yes, Chad, please. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, we just want to thank Vanessa. And her leadership has been great since two or three years. Ashley and I had been working with when Ashley was here. Now, because Vampo is dedicated to safety improvement, we hired a, a full-time staff. Kim is, uh, you know, you heard Kim speak. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we want to continue follow up and partner with some of the strategies and initiatives that Vanessa shared with you today. Uh, that's all. And thank you, Vanessa, for your leadership. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chad. And Vanessa, I just want to make a comment. Um, you made a comment that really resonated with me because we always talk about data-driven decisions and trying to make data-driven decisions. And you said data doesn't make decisions. It's the values that we hold that make the decisions. I think that's that's really profound. I wrote that down and I'm, I'm going to think more about that. So thank you. The other thing is the drive to zero day at the Capitol is February 12th. It's on a Wednesday. It's the day after the election. So your new WAMPO chair maybe could drive a party bus and we could all go into <laughs> planes and represent WAMPO. So if you're starting to lobby to be the new chair, maybe that could be part of your campaign platform <laughs> is that you can get us all to Topeka to advocate. And then I will check out the can the transportation um safety conference, especially since it's here in town. So um, thank you very much. Just so much great information. The other thing that I wrote down that we've lost 2,057 Kansans in the last five years because of safety. And so, you know, hopefully the work that this body is doing, the work that we're doing with the MPOs across the state, but also with our partners at KDOT, maybe in the next five years, we'll see that number dwindle. And that would be really a goal that I think we'd all like to realize. So thank you for your presentation and all the work that you do. Thank you very much. All right. Next on the agenda is the 2024 Major State Corridors Daily VMT AADP report with Peter. Thank you. Could you throw one more acronym in there for me in a long Tuesday? Yes, we have a daily vehicle miles traveled and uh, annual average daily traffic for AADT. So some background on here. During the development of MTP 2050, we looked at existing traffic conditions to inform the long range planning. So this research and analysis we did culminated in not only a robust data for MTP 2050, but also the development of a standalone daily vehicle miles traveled and should be annual average daily traffic report. So going forward, pending review and feedback that we get, we intend to offer this as kind of an annual report so you can see the trends in traffic on our major corridors. So to give a bit more information, VMT is the total number of vehicle miles traveled by all vehicles on a specific roadway segment or in a specific area over the course of a given amount of time. Usually a day, sometimes you'll hear a full year. And it reflects the intensity of road usage and is a crucial measure in transportation planning and traffic analysis. Average or annual average daily traffic is the total volume of vehicle traffic passing over a given location along a roadway on an average day within a given year. Long name, there'll be some graphics that'll make this a little easier to swallow. Um, but it offers detailed insights and we actually use that to estimate vehicle miles traveled along a roadway. So, just kind of do a whirlwind tour of the report. So uh, talk about our data source. The Kansas Department of Transportation maintains traffic data sets that span many years on the entire state system of roadways. So utilizing these resources provided by our state partners, the report explores the daily VMT or vehicle miles traveled and annual average daily traffic on seven major state corridors within WAMPO. The most recent year of available data is from 2023 and the report is divided into three sections. You have the 2023 vehicle miles traveled by corridor, 2023 average annual daily traffic or peak average annual daily traffic by corridor. And then it looks at trends at each individual corridor later on in the report. So these are those major state corridors, I-35, K-254, K-96, I-235, US-54, K-15, and I-135. So going through here, you probably all realize that there's probably more vehicle miles traveled on US 54 than say, I don't know, K254. But if you're curious, it kind of towers and stands out from all the others. US 54, it, it is affected because there's a lot of length across WAMPO, but you can see about 1.6 million daily vehicle miles traveled 
on that piece of infrastructure. And then you can go through and just kind of see that comparative analysis. I've driven on K254 a lot since I've lived here my whole life. I knew it wasn't as busy as US 54, but it feels busy when you get on there. But it significantly has significantly fewer vehicle miles traveled on it than the other roadways, just to give you some context. And that bottom graph there is just the combined VMT of all seven corridors in millions. And you'll kind of see this seagull shaped line graph as we go through. So we go through 2017 through 2019. We got our dip in 2020, and then it goes back up with a slight trend upward. And then the report goes on to look at uh, major state corridor average annual daily traffic. Now, this looks at different segments of roadway, and you can see the darker red and wider the segment, the higher the traffic volume on a daily basis occurs at that location. So going by corridor, for 2023, uh, US 54 took the cake. It was at 118,000 average or annual average daily traffic for uh, from US 54 from South Main Street to South Washington Street. And then you can kind of see just the comparative analysis between all of the other peak sections of roadway on these major corridors. And then the report goes into the individual corridor reports. I just looked at US 54 in this one, and it kind of follows the trend as of, you know, all of the corridors combined, you get that same seagull looking line graph where you have the dip in 2020. Um, and then it kind of looks at the seven year daily trend and lists the peak AADT along that roadway. And then we look at the top three busiest segments year by year. It's, it's US 54, you know, looking at South Seneca to South Main Street, depending on which year you're looking at, all three of these segments might change places. Um, but you can see back in 2021, I think the highest I saw on this roadway and for Wampo, in that case was 121,000 daily vehicle miles traveled on this uh, on US 54 back in 2021. That's a whirlwind tour. I didn't want to waste too much of your time. If, if you are interested, I would encourage you to look at the report. And then, of course, I'd love to have your feedback. This uh, data is available from KDOT. They release it every year, but we try to make it in a more friendly version that you can also see the trends from year to year to year. Is this on the WEMPO website, you said, or is it on KDOT? Uh, the data source is from KDOT. This report is from WEMPO. Right now, it's just linked in the packet. I wanted to offer it for, or we wanted to offer it for feedback before I put it where in a very public place for everybody. So if somebody wanted to go and look at it, they could open up the agenda electronically on the TPV web. So you go to the WAMPO website and then there's a tab for TPV and then there's agendas and you could find the agenda and then click on the link. Yes, okay. it's linked there. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Peter? Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, quick comment that, thank you, Peter, the good job in compiling all the data and making it. So the reason why we started this was most of engineers like Lynn and Paul, we see this data all the time. Uh, but for, uh, for the reason we did this was to uh, develop uh, some sort of performance measure on our system, like how is transportation system performing and give like a top three corridors in magnitude. For example, Kellogg had 118,000 daily commuters as an example. And then the second is I-135 has 96,000 commuters every day as an example. And then K96 has about 67,000 commuters every day. So this gives a perspective on how, you know, each of these corridors within our region is serving our customers, our commuters. And also it helps to compare other communities. For example, if you go to Hutchinson, as an example, there could be a corridor that is about 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, that range, or Topeka, um, and in Kansas City, maybe more than 118,000. So comparing between communities, comparing within our jurisdictions, uh, giving that high level uh, indication of uh, transportation system is the reason why we did this. So just wanted to share the purpose and uh, uh, how to use it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Next, uh, last actually update that we have is the regional transmit, 
transit tr implementation plan update from Bill. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Thank you for joining us today, Bill. Welcome. You're, thank you very much. Um, this will be a relatively short update. Um, and so what I wanted to do is just kind of, well, I guess give you an update. That was pretty simple. Can we go to the next slide so I don't embarrass myself anymore? Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about the status of where we're at. And I think what I really wanna focus on a little bit is some of the deliverables that uh, we will be uh, providing to you in the relatively near future. Um, and then hit a little bit on the employer coordination that to me is is a little bit of a, of a twist that we're adding to the study. Uh, to focus more on some of the larger, uh, maybe have a more specific focus on some of the larger employers that we have within the region um, to get their input um, on a cross-section of those alternatives that we are talking about. So if we go go to the, the next slide, please, and I think we should just go over to the next one. Okay, I think I've used this in the past to kind of give everybody an update as to kind of where are we answering these four critical questions of the overall study that um, I think we've, we've worked our way through the idea of here are all of the alternatives that we have. We've narrowed that list down to, I think, some reasonable alternatives for various communities. And as we're talking about uh, interjecting or bringing more into it employers within the region, we've also got a subset of the whole range of alternatives that are probably more applicable, more appropriate to discuss with that group that we will be talking over as we continue to move forward with them. Um, and that also a part of the process that we're in right now is asking that, that question of, who has enough interest in advancing some of the transit alternatives to invest uh, local dollars into implementation of, of improvements or ad additions of service within the area? And the idea of talking with employers is, can some of the employers within the region also be a potential source of, of the local matching funding that would need to go into any of the transportation improvements that we are talking about here. And, you know, we've been carrying that theme, that message all the way through this study is that if we're going to provide more public transportation service within the region, that we need to also provide local funding because there are the four funding sources that go into transit service. There's federal transit administration dollars that are somewhat based on a formula. There's state um, transit dollars, there are fares, and then there is a local match to the, the federal and state money that essentially makes up the remainder of the subsidy that we need for public transit within any region within the country. So we're at that point now of, of doing that investigation, doing that outreach to understand where funding might come from, because then that's also going to going to help us a little bit in the organizational structure that, that we'll ultimately uh, propose as ideas throughout the region. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, shifting gears a little bit to the deliverables. And in reality, I think based on some very, very recent conversations that we've been having with WAMPO, um, there'll be some adjustments to this schedule. But what we have done and um, have initiated the conversation with with WAMPO is the idea of the, the concepts that we presented to this group, the idea that we've also presented to this group of how we want to be discussing those alternatives, getting input from the localities or the ju local jurisdictions on those alternatives, that we've got some very good uh, input, but then we are we have not got complete input from every one of the jurisdictions within the region. So rather than maybe just focusing on those locations where we have received input, that we've uh, essentially created two categories of a go forward as I like to look at it. That one category is things that may be short term, and those are ideas that we have presented, ideas that we've received support from localities about. Um, so those we would put into a, a short list or a, sh a list of short-term improvement opportunities. Um, and we're uh, 
providing or putting together more information on funding and the cost of those kinds of services. But then we've also developed a category, and this is more, this is newer of what we're calling as aspirational alternatives and concepts. And these are concepts that we believe are good ideas to be continuing to look at within the region, but um, maybe these we, could be applicable in locations where we have not received a lot of feedback from communities as to whether or not they support the alternatives, um, not only from a yes, we as a community think it's a good idea, but also uh, believe that they have the capacity to put some, put some money into that game. Um, so we have developed a list of aspirational alternatives that we will continue to talk with WAMPO staff and prep those for presentation to the TAC and then to the policy body here. Um, starting on Monday, well, I guess it's not starting on Monday, but Monday we have a meeting um, with employers around the region to talk about the study, to talk about uh, alternatives that are applicable, again, to employment. So those would be alternatives that and concepts that would support commuter service, commuter travel, those kinds of things. Um, in that we anticipate that we will we will continue to to work with a, a group of those folks to refine opportunities and see if there are um, employers that maybe have not only the desire and and the need for more service, but do they have some resources that they could they could bring to the table? Um, and we had uh, we also identify here that we would have a draft document by the fifteenth of October. Um, I think that's one of the things that we will adjust, but what I want to um, adjust there is that um, I would want to have a draft document that brings us through the alternatives development and the initial screening, um, and because we can document a lot of the work that we have been, we've been doing over the course of the last year or so. Um, it's just I don't think we can get to a point yet of having a, a complete set of of recommendations, and we will continue to work those as we move forward. Um, and, and then the kind of that review schedule where our intent was to bring a document to TAC and to the policy body in December. Uh, I need to talk a little bit more with Chad about how we need to want to, should adjust that, uh, that schedule to make sure that we're, we're getting that input that we desire from employers. Uh, next slide. Um, and let's just go. To, okay, so again, I, I kind of already identified this, but on Monday, that we will be having a, a kind of a, a workshop, a working session uh, with uh, a, a group of, of employer representatives uh, across the region that is being spearheaded a lot by Workforce Alliance with Keith Lawing. He has been very helpful in putting this together, and I think it will be a very good conversation to have. Um, if you've got employers within or businesses within your community that you think would be interested, um, I think Chad, did you bring the the poster? Um, yeah, it's at uh, it's at uh, it's at the table at every okay uh, for every every member oh. here. Yep. Okay, cool. And uh, you can ha have those employers go with this QR code and, and get a seat at the table for that conversation. Okay, next slide. Um, and again, what are we intending um, to, to discuss with employers? But again, it's what are those real opportunities out there um, for employers to come to the table and be um, more of a partner when it comes to the conversation of providing uh, regional transportation or pu regional public transportation service within the area. So again, we are still talking primarily about the, getting those areas that are outside of Wichita from an employment standpoint, but then also that connectivity between Wichita and the outlying communities because Wichita provides both a source of employment and a, a, um, a source of employees for some of those more suburban, exurban uh, employment opportunities that we have. So there's there's connectivity between the, the smaller exurban communities and, and back into Wichita. 
Okay, um, next slide. And I guess I, I kind of had that one out of out of order a little bit, but I've already, I guess I've already talked a little bit about the deliverables and the schedule. So I think with that, um, I, if there's, does anybody have any questions? Any questions for Bill? I was going to ask you how you were selecting the employer. So I'm glad to hear that you're working with Keith at the Workforce Alliance. I think that makes yep. a lot of sense. So good on you for, for partnering with him. Well, Any other? I fell into that one. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Bill or any comments? Yes, please, Chad. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to add to Bill on, you know, the recent development on major employers. Um, we had been working with uh, Workforce Alliance, Keith Lying, and also a Greater Wichita Partnership as well, Andrew Nave and his staff, on you know finding how can this uh, public-private partnership can evolve, how can this uh, employer need can you know um, reflect in our plans on whatever we are. Uh, so that was the creative part that. Uh, came out of these committee meetings. And so Bill, uh, my uh, Vampa staff picked up on that. And uh, so it's on this Monday. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we are working with KDOT and making sure this momentum continue and extend our contract for the next year as well. So we may come back to this body and up request you the extension of the contract. Right now it's ending in December. So holidays may be coming in soon. So that's all. Just want to uh, update you that uh, there is some momentum in the last stages of this study, um, especially major employers. And also I requested Bill to develop cost structure. If a, if a, let's say Bel Air or Park City wanted to expand transit, how much they should be paying if City of Wichita is interested in expanding, what would that cost look like? So developing some of those loose ends and all um, may May we may request this body for an approval of extension. That's and I think that's so important. I can't speak for my colleagues on Wichita City Council, but I hear anecdotally quite often that we should expand transit and that, you know, it's needed, but nobody really has the data to show, okay, if we had, you know, different shifts for third shift workers, would people really use it? And what would be the most effective times and dates? And if we do go to other municipalities throughout the, the region, what's the most effect, you know, so it's, it's kind of the build it and they will come or, you know, put the bus and they'll come, but will they really? So I'm glad to have some more data um, so we can make data to data driven decisions based on our values, according to Vanessa. But um, so thank you for doing this work, Bill, really appreciate it and look forward to learning more. Thanks. Any, any other questions for Bill or comments? Thank you, Bill. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks a lot. We'll move over to committee and partnership updates uh, regarding the executive committee. Our next meeting is Thursday, November 14th at 11 a.m. All are welcome. It is an open meeting. So if you're interested, we re we meet in the conference room right over in the Metropolitan Area Planning Department. Again, Thursday, November 14th at 11 a.m. It's an awesome meeting. So please join us. Um, next, Kansas Department of Transportation. I know Mike had to jump off, but do y'all have any, or also from the Metro Division, y'all have any updates or anything you want to share? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so on um, Wednesday, September 18th from 4 to 6 p.m., uh, we're going to be doing an open house for a corridor study at K-15 between Derby and Wichita. Um, some stuff that's not in the press release that I wanted to kind of get out there is the, uh, the open house uh, in Derby will be uh, key for receiving community feedback uh, for the study taking place at the K-15 corridor. Uh, there's going to be posters and roll plots to visually convey areas that will be receiving uh, analysis along the K-15. Um, we, 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 we at KDOT, we, we greatly encourage community feedback. Uh, in paragraph two of the press release, uh, that was kind of something that I wanted to point out that this at the uh, open house, there's going to be one-on-one -on -one with the staff. So if there's any questions, we want the community to be able to go there, find out more, see why we're doing this, see uh, the places that we think could use improvements. Uh, there's not gonna be a formal presentation. Um, and this will be the first of three meetings that are gonna take place. So we want um, you know, community involvement as, as early as possible as well on, on this. Um, I was gonna see if there was any questions about the open house uh, before I move to some of our 
uh, Metro updates. And we do have an update at your place if anybody, or not an update, but a handout. So, yep. So uh, a couple of the updates on northbound I-135, 2nd to 17th. This is one of my favorite ones we got going on right now. We've just completed maintenance on the right lane, uh, and we've moved over to the left lane. That is set to conclude in early November. So, you know, enjoy the right lane now. Now that you guys have been, you guys got it back. Uh, phase three started for the north and southbound Eisenhower Airport Parkway. Uh, work is shifting from the left lane on that one to the right lane. So um, that's set to conclude in October. Uh, northbound I-135 to westbound K-96, that's going to be closed for reconstruction starting next Monday, September 16th. And that's set to go on till uh, early October. So a lot, a lot of fun stuff happening. Any questions, comments? All right, last but not least, Federal Highway, maybe Will. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Will, I, thanks for joining yeah, us. Of course, thanks for having me. Uh, I have no updates at this time. Thank you. Briefest report ever. Thank you so much. Um, any other business or any updates or comments for the good of the order? All right, seeing none, we will go ahead and I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting today. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. Anyone opposed? Stay. Have a great day. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>